Hello everyone, today I'm going to talk about pharmacokinetics and specifically compartmental modeling. I do not have any financial conflicts of interest. I'm making these videos as part of preparation for the CICM primary exam. I'll go through some broad concepts and then narrow down on three compartment models for common critical care drugs, fentanyl, propofol and midazolam. So pharmacokinetics are the study of what the body does to a drug, where it goes in the body and how it is removed. Pharmacokinetics is often subdivided according to the mnemonic ADME for absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination. This video will focus on distribution, where the drug goes in the body. We measure the dispersal of a substance by its concentration, simply the quantity of substance per volume in a sample. A major driver of distribution, particularly between compartments, is diffusion. Increasing entropy favours the overall movement of a substance from a region of high concentration to low in a very similar manner to temperature. Another form of movement is convection of fluids. For example, the rapid intermixing of venous blood as it passes back through the heart. If you see the term well stirred in a textbook, it refers to the assumption that within a compartment, the drug or substance is rapidly and evenly mixed. So what is a compartment. A compartment is a hypothetical region that a drug occupies. It is not a real space, though it can closely match real spaces in the body, such as the blood or plasma. We use compartments to form simpl simplified models of the body to allow us to model pharmacokinetics mathematically. Before I go any further with models, I'm going to introduce an analogy because concentration gradients are really hard to illustrate on a screen. This is the hydraulic analogy, which I'll be using throughout the presentation. It involves compressing the 3D volume of a compartment into a 2D flat area and using the third vertical dimension to represent concentration. This has many advantages because concentration is already depicted vertically in the same fashion on the y-axis of many graphs. We can treat the drug as a quantity of fluid where the quantity of fluid represents the quantity of drug. All the math still works and due to gravity, the concentration height will try to stabilize in the same manner as, manner as diffusion. Concentration is defined as the quantity of substance within a volume or of space or solvent. This means that we need to define a volume for the drug to exist in, known as the volume of distribution. In the analogy, the liquid flows out to fill this space until it gives an even height. Rearranging our concentration equation, this is the amount of drug divided by the concentration. It also works with the analogy because if you divide that red cylinder's volume by its height, you get the area of the base. This single volume of distribution is a one compartment model. Like I said before, this is a hypothetical volume. The real human body is almost infinitely complex. We can't track where all those molecules of drug go in practice. We don't know what shape the volume takes. It's certainly not an even height as depicted here. This is how I picture it. Imagine you can't see the base of this cylinder at all. It's just a big underground tank and you're looking in from above. All you know is that you've poured in a defined volume of drug and you want to know what space it fills. All you can do to assess it is poke a stick down and measure the level it reached once it had settled. This is what we do with patients. We give a drug and then we take a blood sample and measure the level. There are some subtleties regarding whether you measure plasma free or total or whole blood concentration, but we could ignore that for now. Volume of distribution is defined by a patient's body size, is determined by a patient's body size and composition, but more importantly, by the properties of the drug itself. As you can see in this table and the original equation, volume of distribution is inversely proportional to the relative plasma concentration and varies with the ratio of amount of drug in plasma versus tissue. If the drug binds with high affinity to components of peripheral body tissues, the concentration remaining in the plasma will be low, and because the model assumes an even distribution, the calculated volume of distribution will be massive. Notable examples include azithromycin, amiodarone, and chloroquine. Conversely, large molecules such as peptides with limited diffusion capability will have a volume of distribution much closer to that of plasma. The last variable that we can extract from the concentration equation is dose. This is used to generate a loading dose, which in theory is the amount of drug needed to give, we need to give at once to bring the plasma concentration to a certain level 
once it's dispersed through the entire volume of distribution. The next important pharmacokinetic concept to discuss is clearance. Clearance is the volume of a compartment that has all of its drug removed per unit time. Because it features a volume, in the hydraulic analogy, that's an area at the base. This gives us an adaptation of the hydraulic model known as the bathtub model of clearance. Clearance is depicted on the diagram as a drain at the bottom of the bathtub or compartment. If you look at the top and 3D views, you should be able to see that for this one given unit of time, the volume represented by clearance is completely cleared of drug. Specifically, it's the entire column above the drain, which means that the absolute quantity of drug removed, known as elimination, depends on the concentration or height of the red fluid. I've put a variety of example units with the equations as any of them can be used. The only rule is that they need to match. For example, when describing the properties of a drug, volume of distribution is often given as liters per kilo of body weight. This would mean that clearance also needs to be scaled to body weight to keep the volume units consistent. Knowing the rate of clearance of a drug can immediately give useful insights into its metabolism and elimination. While kidneys receive a large amount of blood flow, around 20 to 25% of cardiac output, or over a litre per minute, almost all of, and almost all of this passes through the glomerulus, their potential clearance is diminished by the fact that only plasma undergoes filtration, and the fraction of that filtered is about 20%. As a result, the glomerular filtration rate is around 2 mils per kilo per minute, or 140 mils per minute for a 70 kilogram adult. This represents the maximum possible renal clearance by filtration. If a drug is protein bound, this also excludes it from filtration. So a purely renally eliminated drug will necessarily have a clearance of between zero and two mils per kilo per minute. Meanwhile, the liver gets about 25% more perfusion than the kidneys, which is about 1.5 liters per minute or 21 mils per kilo per minute. Unlike the kidneys, the liver can theoretically extract up to 100% of the drug reaching it. Specifically, it's the hepatic blood flow times the drug's hepatic extraction ratio. This means that if the drug's clearance is anywhere between two and 21 mils per kilo per minute, it can't just be renally eliminated and it's probably hepatically eliminated. For simplicity, you could probably round the upper number to 20. Lastly, if a drug's clearance exceeds hepatic blood flow, you can tell it must also undergo extra hepatic elimination. For example, propofol's clearance is about 30 mils per kilo per minute, and remifentanil's is about 40 mils per kilo per minute. Both of these undergo extra hepatic clearance. There might be a few exceptions for relatively low extraction drugs, but otherwise it's a very handy rule of thumb. Now, another concept that you'll see related to clearance is the rate constant known as K. In this case, the rate constant of elimination or KE. As you can see in the equation, this removes the volume component from the clearance, leaving the inver inverse of time as units. In the hydraulic bathtub model, it's the fraction of the area of the large circle that is cleared by the small circle for each unit of time. For a more generalizable function, the rate of change of concentration per unit time is given by negative k times the current concentration to the power of n, where n is the order of the rate process. For this video, I'll only be discussing first order processes. These follow simple exponential decay functions in a one compartment model, where ke represents the fraction of concentration and the fraction of total drug which are removed per unit time. For example, this function shows um, the concentration of insulin after an IV bolus, which follows a one compartment model. The equation is based on the differential above it with C0 representing the starting concentration. We can also use K to determine the half-life. For example, here, insulin has a Ke of about 0.1 per minute. The natural log of 2 is around 0.69, and the half-life of IV insulin is therefore between 6 and 7 minutes. 
the inverse of k is known, also known as the time constant. It's just another way of describing the same thing. I won't be using it in this presentation. While we're looking at elimination at the elimination graph, there's one more definition of clearance that is independent of volumes, and it's just the dose divided by the total area under the curve. This applies to any function, not just a simple exponential one. The F stands for bioavailability, which just means that we're talking about the portion of drug that reaches the main compartment, so we don't have to consider that for intravenous administration. This is useful, for example, in non-compartmental analysis. Now, I did find one question a little confusing initially regarding the bathtub model of clearance. What happens if the clearance volume is greater than the compartment volume? This would equate to a Ke value greater than 1 or a drain size larger than the bathtub. On the simple depiction so far, this would drain the whole quantity of drug in less than one time interval which isn't even a first order reaction. So can it happen? Well, it can have a, it can have a elimination constant greater than one, um, but it's not a problem. This, this can be true, in fact, for any drug. All you have to do is change the units of time that you're using. If we look back at the graph for insulin in the top right and change the time units from minutes to hours, then the rate constant of elimination becomes 6.4. That doesn't mean anything in practice because the units are actually arbitrary. The functions always assume that the time units for calculation are infinitesimally small. For the bathtub analogy, it works best if the clearance volume is considerably smaller than the compartment volume, but if it was bigger, it wouldn't really be a problem. In a first order process, you can see in the cylinder, after each small time interval, the, the drug redistributes to occupy the cleared volume at a fractionally lower concentration, leading to this exponential decay pattern. As you can see, first order elimination is more efficient when the concentration is relatively high. What happens if we fill the bathtub at the same time? Because the rate in is constant, but the rate out depends on concentration or fluid height, the height will increase until it reaches a steady state where the rate of elimination matches the rate of administration. What maintenance rate should we choose to reach a given steady state concentration? Well, if you look at the elimination equation on the bottom, bottom left, clearance equals the rate out divided by our target concentration. But because it's a steady state, we can swap rate out for rate in because they're equal. Therefore, the rate in is just the clearance times the target concentration. If you wanted, you could work this out without any volumes or models, just using the area under the curve equation to find clearance. So let's apply some of this. Imagine that you're a brand new ICU resident looking after a 56 year old man with sepsis on a small amount of noradrenaline for blood pressure support. A nurse hands you this ECG and states that the patient has suddenly developed rapid atrial fibrillation, and as a result, his noradrenaline requirement has increased from five micrograms per minute to 10. He otherwise looks okay, no chest pain or dyspnea. You call your consultant, who suggests an IV loading dose of amiodarone to settle down the rate and perhaps even convert him back to sinus rhythm. Now you haven't charted IV amiodarone before, but you figure you could probably do this from first principles. You pull out your phone to calculate a loading dose. We have the equation from before. Concentration is amount over volume. This can be rearranged to concentration times vo volume of distribution to give the loading dose. You do some Googling and find that a therapeutic concentration of amiodarone is about 1.5 milligrams per liter. And then you find that the volume of distribution of amiodarone is very large and it's about 66 liters per kilo of body weight, or 6,000 liters for this patient. You think that is very large and plug it into the equation. You take your result and request that the patient receive a loading dose of nine grams of amiodarone. I mean, it's fine. He has a central line, so you shouldn't get phlebitis and all rapidly mix through his circulation. You add that it can go over 30 minutes just to be safe. 
his nurse looks at you skeptically and tells you that would be 60 ampules of amiodarone. Are you sure you don't want to give 300 milligrams? You're pretty happy with your math, so you confirm that's the dose you want. She refuses to kill the patient and asks if there's someone more senior who can give you a hand. So where did it go wrong? One problem is that your consultant used imprecise language. They didn't really want a loading dose. A loading dose of amiodarone would indeed be about 9 grams IV, but it's usually given as the oral equivalent dose over between 1 and 6 weeks. The other problem is that patients aren't perfectly homogeneous glass cylinders and drugs don't instant, instantly distribute. This is more relevant than, for some drugs than others. Unlike the simple bathtub scenario, with an amiodarone infusion, the initial removal of the drug is mostly due to massive redistribution rather than elimination. That said, if you give it fast enough, you do reach an apparent steady state where the concentration is significantly elevated from baseline, as you can see in the center here. When I say concentration, I mean the concentration at the effect site, which is the heart. This is the reason that 9 grams would have been an overdose. We were treating amiodarone as if it followed a one compartment model, when in reality it needs at least two, a small central compartment and a large peripheral one. What might this two compartment model look like? It's similar to the first one, except we have two volumes of distribution and two clearances now. One elimination clearance from the central compartment V1 and one distribution clearance between V1 and V2. The distribution clearance can be thought of as the volume of fluid from each compartment that equilibrate with each other per unit time. In the hydraulic analogy, it acts the same as elimination clearance, except with elimination, there's no fluid pressure to equilibrate with on the other side, so it just flows out. From now on, I'm going to show the clearances on the side of the vessels for clarity. You, you just have to assume that they're low enough that they act like they're at the base. So what happens when we give an IV dose of amiodarone? Typically we start with a so-called loading dose of five milligrams per kilo or 150 to 300 milligrams over a short period. This will create markedly elevated read levels in the central compartment, which can often reach the 20 to 40 milligram per, kilogram, uh, per litre range. This would be severely toxic with chronic use, but it's desirable and safe in the very short term. This is often uh, followed by a so-called maintenance infusion of another 10 milligrams per kilo or 900 milligrams or so over about 24 hours. As soon as the rate is reduced, the concentration rapidly declines by over 90% within an hour. And after 24 to 48 hours of administration, uh, the level may be reaching the low therapeutic range. After this, the patient may be transitioned to oral therapy to complete the loading dose if therapy is to be continued. But if it is ceased, levels will later become subtherapeutic due to redistribution. Let's talk some more about compartmental models. For amiodarone, we had two compartments, a small central one and a large peripheral. The two volumes can be added together and thought of as a steady state volume of distribution. This can be compared with the original one compartment model above. In both, you have a clearance known as CR1 and an associated elimination rate constant now called K10, but this is the same as the elimination rate constant KE mentioned before. To keep things simple, most models only have elimination from the central compartment, but some drugs with organ independent clearance may not follow this. I'm going to very briefly show you a bunch of equations in a moment. The only thing I think is really useful to know is how to convert between rate constants and clearances. Here, because um, between two compartments there is one clearance and two rate constants, I think it's more useful to know the clearances uh, because they're more physiologically relevant. And if you know the volumes and one clearance, you can use that to calculate two rate constants. I always think of it in terms of going out. The, um, for example, if you wanted to calculate K10 for either model, you need V1 and CL1 because it's going out from V1. The equation is simply CL1 divided by V1. If you want K12, 
the constant from V1 to V2, you are going out from V1. So you use Cl2 divided by V1. And finally, K21 is going to be going out from V2. So you use V2 and Cl2. I've already mentioned how if you graph an IV bolus with a one compartment model, you'll have simple exponential decay. I'm going to convert it to slightly different nomenclature for this slide for reasons that will become clear. In this case, K is replaced with the rate constant alpha. You can also derive time constants and half-lives for the rate constants like before. If you plot it on a log scale, you get an exact straight line. This should make sense. It gets a bit more complicated when you go up to a two compartment model. Now you have a function that's a combination of two exponential functions with their own magnitudes a and b and rate constants alpha and beta. From here on, these hybrid rate constants are not equal to any one of the original rate constants. Those are the ones starting with k. I'll show you what they are derived from in a minute. This is because the system is complex and you have elimination and distribution and then redistribution all happening together. On the log scale in the center, you can see that for the blue bi-exponential function, it approximates the magenta function and, um, early and then the yellow function later. These being the two simple exponential functions that are added together. The function depicts an early distribution phase as it reaches equilibrium and then a late elimination phase as it redistributes back and the remaining drug is slowly eliminated from V1. If you can't quite picture how all of this works yet, I'm going to show it much more visually in the next section, so bear with me. For that, we need to look at three compartments. This is what's required to describe the kinetics of a drug such as fentanyl. It's clearly just an extrapolation of the two compartment model. Most commonly, you have a relatively small central compartment V1 which generally encompasses blood and parts of highly perfused tissues um, and organs such as heart, lungs, liver, and kidneys. Again, it's a model, so it's not a one-to-one -one match. V2 is often called the fast compartment and roughly corresponds with well-perfused tissues such as muscle. Finally, there's V3, often called the slow compartment, which best corresponds with adipose tissue as well as other poorly perfused um, tissues. For fat-soluble drugs such as many sedatives and analgesics, this compartment can be quite large. Along with the three volumes, there are three clearances and five rate constants, which can be derived in the same fashion as for the two-compartment model. An IV bolus in a three-compartment model follows a tri-exponential function with three hybrid rate constants in three phases. Typically, they're described for as a rapid distribution phase, a slow distribution phase, and a terminal elimination phase. I'm going to stop at three because most models do not benefit from having more, although sometimes people use five compartments for gaseous anesthetics and occasionally more than that for hyperbaric medicine. I'm now going to outline how to ca calculate the coefficients in the hybrid rate constants. I'll keep this brief, but I think it's useful for two reasons. The first is to show how quickly the required mathematics escalate with the number of compartments. And secondly, there'll be a few people like me who just want to play around with the values themselves. For one compartment, it's easy enough, and you can learn this. The alpha rate constant is just K. The coefficient A is the same as C0, which is um, one divided by the volume of distribution. All of these equations are assuming that the drug dose is one unit. Uh, for a, a different dose, you simply multiply the whole function by that dose. So any function going on, including the tri-exponential one, you just put brackets around it and times it by the dose. This scaling makes the models quite easy to work with um, because they'll act the same, um, they'll have the same shape and um, relation to each other no matter what dose you give. Although in reality, the order of some reactions, particularly elimination, is likely to change at very high or very low doses. For example, if a mechanism becomes saturated or greatly exceeds the quantity of a drug. So it's just a model, it's not perfect. As soon as you reach the two compartment model, the rate constants you need to, uh, to derive the rate constants, you need to solve a quadratic equation with two intermediate variables and then use those to calculate the coefficient. Once you reach three compartments, it becomes stupidly complex and honestly beyond my understanding of mathematics. So let's see, 
I suspect this is a trigonometry based method to solve a cubic equation, but that's just my best guess. You calculate three intermediates from the rate constants. Then you calculate three more intermediates. Then you determine these three roots, which you can arrange from largest to smallest to give the hybrid rate constants. And then you finally use those to calculate the coefficients. And that's just for an IV bolus, the simplest form of drug administration for a model to deal with. Anything else is going to need very advanced mathematics or some kind of simulation. So I have a simulation for you that doesn't use any mathematics at all, and it's our hydraulic model. This is my hydraulic three compartment model. I'm very proud of how well this worked, and I'd encourage you to try it out. It's made from four three-way taps and three syringes with the plungers removed. The cross-sectional area of each syringe represents the volume of each compartment, and the linear height of the fluid in the tubes is the concentration in each compartment. The volume as depicted on the syringe markings represents the quantity of drug in each compartment, as, as we discussed before. I chose the syringe sizes to approximate ratios for a fentanyl model, and the clearances were somewhat trial and error to get the time scale I wanted. The intercompartmental clearances are determined by partially closing the two lateral three-way taps to create the appropriate degree of resistance. Everything medial to the green and red taps is considered the central compartment. Clearance one was created by attaching an IVJ loop with the end cut off to the outflow of V1. The length of narrow tube provides adequate resistance. The apparatus is sitting on a bowl propped up with sticky tape. If you wanted to quantify the output of the model as I've done here, I found the easiest way was to video it and read the quantity of fluid in each compartment at set time intervals using the syringe markers. To convert it from volume, uh, from quantity to the height or concentration, I measured the length of the scale on each syringe. For example, on the V2 syringe, it's 10 milliliters in 6.1 centimeters to give a conversion factor of 0.61 centimeters per mil. The video depicts me adding a total of five mils of colored water to the central compartment over about five seconds. For that, I just used another 10 mil syringe with the plunger removed and my thumb over the end. This will represent a very short infusion or slow bolus. The heights of fluid representing the concentration in each compartment will appear plotted on the left. You should also be able to see the relative movement between the compartments with arrows on the video. So immediately we'll see a big spike in the concentration in our central compartment as it contains most of the drug. This is the peak time for movement to the other compartments and for elimination as the, they are concentration dependent. The rapid fall in V1 is mostly due to rapid redistribution and that's mostly to V2. Once V1 equilibrates with V2, it enters the second slow redistribution phase. Drug is still moving from V3 uh, moving to V3 as the V1 and V2 heights are greater. As V1 falls, V2 essentially matches it due to the high clearance between them. When the two reach the height of V3, it um, signifies the uh, final phase of slow elimination. They now start to act as one large steady state volume. Elimination from V1 is slow as the concentration is low. As it falls, drug will slowly trickle back from V3, which is acting as a reservoir. And eventually the last of the fluid will be cleared. You can see all, the, all of the compartments have been emptied at this point, essentially. Now there's sometimes, sometimes one additional compartment in these models, which uh, is known as the effect site. It's an incomplete compartment that doesn't have any volume. And it is just there to um, demonstrate a temporal lag for the, from the concentration in V1 to equilibrate with the effect site. Um, which is typically the central nervous system. 
it could be represented by an extremely thin vertical tube that's attached to the V1 section with some resistance between them. Apart from providing a time delay, it can also blunt large changes in V1 concentration, and it's used in some algorithms for target controlled anesthetic delivery via smart infusion pumps. Other models simply, uh, simply target the V1 concentration. In practice, a pump with effect site targeting might be more aggressive with its delivery of V1 concentrations as it's calculating that the effect will be blunted. If you can picture a ventilator that has automatic tube compensation algorithms, they use a similar principle to estimate tracheal pressure based on the applied pressure and tube resistance. Now, I wanted to explore a couple of other examples with the syringe model, but I no longer have the same setup or time for multiple videos, so I'll depict what they would have looked like. As a reminder, the volumes or areas of these three compartments uh, represent the volumes of distributions and those represent our patient. Many models will scale the volumes based on patient's total body weight. And some use additional scaling factors, for example, with so-called allometric scaling in pediatrics. A couple of adult propofol models actually use fixed volumes. The compartments don't necessarily have to scale together and could be adjusted theoretically for uh, body composition. For example, you could, um, you could predict that elderly patients might have a relative decrease in um, uh, the vo volume of distribution of V1 and V2 by about 30%, with a corresponding increase in V3 by about the same. These reflect changes in total body water and muscle mass. The changes in volume of the central compartment might indicate that lower bolus doses might be required um, to avoid side effects from the peak concentration. These patients are also likely to have reduced elimination due to age-related changes in organ function. Clearances can be represented as a sub-volume of a compartment being cleared of solutes or being mixed with an adjacent compartment in the case of distribution clearance. Those can be scaled in a similar fashion to compartment volumes, although some established models will avoid this by just specifying uh, the fixed rate constants instead and using the conversion factors, uh, the conversion process to automatically adjust for volume of distribution. As the model is semi-physiological, clearances can also be thought of as a fraction of cardiac output rather than a fixed rate. For example, in a low cardiac output model, you might see um, drugs staying longer in the central compartment um, due to both reduced tissue distribution and elimination. For full implications of this, you need to know where the effect site is. For example, if you're planning a rapid sequence in, um, intubation for a patient in hypovolemic or cardiogenic shock, you'd probably use a much lower dose of sedating agent because as is typical, the effect site is close to V1. But you still you may need a larger dose of neuromuscular blocker because in that case um, the neuromuscular junction has a um, is more is better modeled by V2. If you had a patient with a high cardiac output state, you will see a rapid distribution to peripheral compartments and a rapid clearance with a less pronounced peak in V1 concentration. Now the clearances don't always scale together. You, you might have patients with organ dysfunction that significantly limits elimination, for example, severe renal or hepatic impairment, depending on the drug. With our syringe model, to simulate a state of low elimination clearance, imagine just clamping the J-loop that is the outflow for the V1 compartment. You can hopefully imagine what this would do if I was to give an IV bolus. The drug simply equilibrates with V2 first and then V3, and then they just sit there all at the same concentration in equilibrium. This is a very important concept for compartmental models. If the distribution clearance is significantly larger than the elimination clearance, the drug will escape to the tissues preferentially and have a much larger duration of elimination. This helps explain how different lipophilic drugs will have different behavior. 
Fentanyl would be at the high distribution end of the spectrum, but we'll look at some comparisons later. Now let's look at a drug with rapid elimination clearance from V1, such as propofol. To model this, let's just remove that J loop completely. With a bolus, you'll see a big peak in V1 concentration and then rapid elimination with hardly any distribution to the other compartments. That which does distribute to the other compartments diffuses back out quickly because V1 was rapidly cleared. You'll only see significant redistribution if the V1 concentration remains elevated, for example, with an infusion. With first order clearance, any infusion will cause some degree of steady state elevation. Let's see how infusions behave in the model. And for this, we'll um, use a patient example. For this example, we're going back to fentanyl. An intubated 68-year-old woman is admitted to ICU from the operating theatre following laparotomy and small bowel resection for mesenteric ischemia. The initial plan is to keep her mechanically ventilated for 24 hours in case she deteriorates and needs to go back to theatre. She's sedated with propofol, but you also want a fentanyl infusion to provide analgesia and to augment sedation. Because she's only about 50 kilos, you think about 60 micrograms per hour of fentanyl should be adequate and start it as a constant infusion. For these ones, I used a spreadsheet-based simulator to model the drug and work backwards. The model included an infect site, but in these scenarios, it was always very close to V1, so I, I'm not going to show it. A slow infusion is going to act very differently to the bolus um, style kinetics that we've seen so far. We're still looking at first order elimination, so we start at zero and slowly increase concentration as it tries to reach a steady state for V1, like we saw in the one compartment bathtub model. As the initial V1 concentration is low, it's much easier for peripheral um, concentrations to reach and equilibrate. So the system will stay close to the equilibrium for the entire simulation. The biggest difference will be again with V3 due to its large volume and low perfusion. So the levels will lag behind somewhat, but the difference is not as marked as following a bolus. Over time, the compartments get closer together and the system is nearly at equilibrium by 24 hours. At steady state, the concentration will be determined only by the rate of administration because this is constant and the V1 um, concentration will stay about constant. You might notice a problem though. For the first two hours, she barely has any pain control at all. It's all being redistributed too fast to reach a decent concentration in V1. The patient's opioid naive, so we might expect to see some pain relief between around 0.5 to 1 microgram per litre and a decent pain reduction around 1.5, which it takes 12 hours to reach. We only get to the peak level when we're thinking about extubating her at 24 hours. If we increase the infusion to 100 micrograms per hour, we would see a faster rise to the analgesic range, but at 24 hours, the concentration would be over three, causing profound analgesia and significant respiratory depression. When we turn off the propofol and the fentanyl, we find that she's not getting very good minute volumes on the ventilator. It takes about two hours for spontaneous breathing to be adequate and she's eventually extubated. What's the half-life of fentanyl from this steady state? If you look at the blue trace on the graph, at 24 hours, the concentration is two and it takes five hours to reach one, so, which gives us a 300 minute half-life. This is the terminal elimination half-life and the maximal con context sensitive half-time for this patient with the context being the duration of the infusion. You see very similar kinetics with a fentanyl patch, although a slower onset and offset which means they can take days to work properly. In this case, the washout wasn't that big a problem, but it could have been if we'd used a higher dose infusion. The infusion rate is what determines the steady state concentration. Had we given 100 micrograms per hour, it would take seven hours to get back to 1.5. Misjudging a steady state infusion with fentanyl or midazolam could potentially delay a patient's extubation by days. We see less of this problem with propofol as the long-term ter long rate is limited by toxicity and it has a much higher clearance. 
which we'll discuss later. So we can see that this dosing strategy was suboptimal. It took too long to work and the steady state concentration was too high. So we need to give more at the start and less in steady state, which means we need a loading dose. What happens if we give essentially the same amount of fentanyl except as 500 micrograms over one hour and then a 40 microgram per hour infusion? Giving it over one hour instead of a genuine bolus would be to avoid very high concentration effects like chest wall rigidity or cardiovascular compromise. Let's see. I had to scale the volumes on the syringes slightly so it fit in the 3 mil syringe, but the graph is going to be on the same scale. We get a large spike in V1 and V2 concentration that peaks with the end of the infusion at one hour. It's a bit super therapeutic for an hour or two, but who cares? She's intubated and on mandatory ventilation and importantly, not in pain. What you'll see on the graph is that we reach equilibrium also with V3 at about two or three hours instead of 24 hours, which means that we can give a significantly smaller maintenance infusion and keep her level exactly where, where we want it. Once she's extubated, we'll just put her straight on a fentanyl patient controlled analgesia device as long as she's awake enough to um, use it, which will work wonderfully because all of her compartments are already in the therapeutic range. This is fine if you have a computer model of a patient, but how do you dose it in reality? There are suggested weight-based doses for both loading and infusion, but it's gonna be an estimate. In a ventilated patient, that's fine, but if the patient is breathing spontaneously, there can be less margin for error. Unfortunately, there's also a loss of variation in terms of the pharmacodynamic response to opioids, particularly in the setting of tolerance, as well as a patient's vulnerability to complications due to factors such as sleep apnea or COPD. As a result, you need to correlate with the patient's clinical status. I, I quite like fentanyl as an analgesic. It's a clean drug in terms of side effects and has, it's a strong opioid, it works quickly. When, and when it's given as small IV boluses, it's very safe. The peak effect is about five minutes. So if a patient is going to develop excessive sedation, you'll see it immediately. And then it will settle down as the drug redistributes. If the dose is inadequate, again, you'll see it quickly. The problem is that the redistribution means that people think it's wearing off as the efficacy appears to dissipate over the next hour. As we know, it's not gone, it's just more spread out. The triphasic kinetics can be an advantage in some ways. The more you have, have to give to a patient, the longer the effect lasts. You just need to get those tissue concentrations up without causing respiratory depression. From my experience in emergency departments, nurses will start to get frustrated after giving about 200 micrograms worth of IV boluses. But for an adult, you probably need to give three or 400 micrograms to get a decent V3 level. Another option would be subcutaneous dosing, which significantly blunts the initial V1 spike, although it also slows the peak effect, meaning um, much longer for titration and slower pain control. And likewise with buccal and intranasal administration, except with those, you also need to think about bioavailability. A patient controlled IV pump, for example, with a 20 microgram bolus will work eventually. You just don't, you just can't judge the patient if they haven't been loaded and they need to press it a couple of dozen times for the first few hours until they get la lasting comfort. Fentanyl patches are probably the worst possible option. They're typically used in relatively low monitoring settings and they have all the disadvantages of a, a constant infusion and even less predictable. They're slow to reach peak effect and if that peak is too high, the patient can't take it off if they pass out. There have been other, some more novel approaches such as a fentanyl challenge where preoperative patients are given a very high, uh, two microgram per kilo per minute dose of um, fentanyl infusion until their respiratory rate dropped to five breaths a minute and then stopped. This was used to inform subsequent PCIA dosing. In the last section, I'll look at some typical parameters for a fentanyl model and compare it to other drugs. But first, we need to think about how the, pa the model actually reflects the patient in front of us. This is our actual patient. They're not made of three compartments. They're a complex, dynamic, and unique set of molecules and cells. We can assess them via markers such as weight, height, serum creatinine, age, 
We can assess how drugs behave through therapeutic drug monitoring or more commonly by assessing their vital signs and symptoms such as pain. If we were to give a controlled large drug bolus to a patient and measured serial levels, which could be possible in the perioperative setting, we could derive an individualized pharmacokinetic profile. If we were to fit that to a three compartment model, we'd derive our next category, which is the theoretical best possible comp compartmental model that's individualized to this patient at this time. The model would account for factors such as the effects of low cardiac output and organ dysfunction on the various clearances. It's probably what we're vaguely picturing when we use our understanding of pharmacology to guide treatment, but we can't routinely use it quantitatively because we don't know the numbers. So what's our next option? Next best option is a population-based model that's ideally scaled to better match our patient's physio physiology and body composition. These are frequently used in the operative setting, particularly for propofol-based intra intravenous anesthesia with computerized pumps. They are the best validated and most common quantitative models that we use. Finally, our last category are general unscaled values of questionable validity in an attempt to describe the intrinsic properties of the drug. These are what you might find in a textbook or repeat in an exam. And this is what I'm gonna use in the final section. Specifically, I compiled all of the population-based models I could find for the various drugs and tried to work out some general average parameters to quote. Bear this in mind, the actual numbers aren't as important as their relative sizes and comparisons. So here we have some typical values for fentanyl. Fentanyl is one of the best examples of a drug which requires a three compartment model for its pharmacokinetics. If you look at a representative tri-exponential decay curve, you can see the three distinct phases which are described in the video section. The half-lives for the distribution rate constants are one and 17 minutes, and the terminal elimination half-life is typically between 300 and 500 minutes, or five to eight hours. This is the final context-sensitive half-life where the context is the duration of the infusion. You'll notice that it has very distinct compartments and clearances and a relatively small central compartment, which is about 10 liters per 70 kilo adult. It has a larger fast compartment, which is about 32 liters, and a much larger slow compartment, which is about 250 liters, illustrating the very high affinity fentanyl has for lipids. V3 accounts for most of fentanyl's steady state volume of distribution. The reason we need three compartments rather than two is the different intercompartmental clearances. Despite V3 having eight times the volume, C2, Cl2 is almost twice as high as Cl3. As we saw in the syringe video, the filling and unfilling of V2 is much faster than V3, but due to V3's massive capacity, it creates that very slow tail. The other reason distribution is so important is because of the relationship to the elimination clearance. Fentanyl has an elimination clearance of eight mils per kilo per minute from V1, which puts it firmly in the hepatic range. This fits because fentanyl is extensively metabolized by hepatic CYP3A4 to an inactive metabolite. This is the main reason fentanyl is not administered enterically. Check out the ratio of the distribution clearances to elimination. CL2 is six times greater than CL1, and even the slow CL3 is about three times greater than CL1. This means that like amiodarone, fentanyl would rather hide in the tissue than be eliminated. Let's compare fentanyl with another common critical care drug, midazolam. If you look at the log scale graph, midazolam has less distinct phases, which fits with the fact that it can actually be described by a two compartment model. It is hepatically metabolized at a similar rate, but its distribution clearances and volumes are lower, suggesting it has slightly lower penetration into membranes and tissues. This also means that the ratio of distribution clearances to elimination clearances are lower at about three and one fold. This means that midazolam has a smaller terminal elimination half-life, which is about 100 to 200 minutes. Propofol is where things get a bit more interesting. The most obvious thing should be that 
the compartments look a lot more like those for fentanyl, as propofol is also very lipophilic. In terms of pharmaceutics, the main distinguishing feature is its insolubility in water for a therapeutic dose. I'll discuss that more in my next video. It has a similar tri-exponential decay pattern to fentanyl, but notice that the magnitude of the final limb is several times up to an order of magnitude lower than for uh, fentanyl and midazolam at those scales. What really sets propofol apart is its elimination clearance, which is a massive 30 mil mils per kilo per minute. As you can see in the top left, this puts it in the extra hepatic range. This is because propofol is highly metabolized by uh, multiple organs. 60% is metabolized by the liver, where it has a 90% extraction ratio. The kidneys contribute to a third of its clearance. And that's not renal filtration, it's renal metabolism, which is why the clearance can be five times the maximum um, figure that you'd get for renal filtration. Finally, the remaining 7% is metabolized by other tissues, mostly small intestine, although possibly also the lungs. You might notice that unlike fentanyl, the elimination clearance is about equal or greater than the distribution clearance. So elimination in this case is more significant than for distribution. If you look at the hybrid rate constants with half times of 2, 22 and 320 minutes, you'll notice these are still very similar to fentanyl. So why don't we see this long washout time that we see with fentanyl? There's a couple of reasons for this. As I showed in the hydraulic, um, hydraulic model, if you have a very high elimination clearance, most of the drug will not be redistributed, and therefore the magnitude of the redistribution back to V1 will be lower, which is reflected in the lower magnitude on the graph. We also don't give very high doses of propofol for long periods due to the risk of deadly metabolic toxicity. Finally, as a general anesthetic, the effect of propofol is relatively binary, so if there was a small lingering concentration, it's probably not clinically significant. These factors mean that despite what the model implies, propofol actually has an effective maximum context sensitive half-life, which is much closer to the beta half-time um, of about 20 minutes. Now, if you want to look at the pharmacology of propofol in more depth, I found an excellent review article here, which gave me the organ-specific metabolism data and is very comprehensive. You can find it free online. I'll also put a link in the description. This is a depiction of context-sensitive half-time, how half-life varies with infusion duration for our three drugs. Again, these values are averaged from a couple of sources, for example, Miller and Stolting's textbooks. And here are a few other drugs for comparison, including thiopentol, dexmedetomidine, and the main fentanyl analogues in clinical use. I'll start with sufentanyl, which is more potent than fentanyl and shorter acting when used in the short term. Although if you look at the trend, it has a similar pattern of accumulation with more prolonged infusions, and the terminal elimination half-life approaches that of fentanyl. Alfentanyl is popular in anesthesia because its context-sensitive half-time curve is much flatter and maxes out between 50 and 120 minutes, depending on your source. Remifentanyl is the ultimate opioid for context-independent elimination, with an even faster offset than propofol. In terms of sedatives, thiopentol is highly lipophilic and does accumulate with a terminal elimination half-life of over 10 hours. This necessitates some degree of neurological monitoring when it's used for prolonged periods, although that is uncommon and usually, usually in the setting of status epilepticus, where EEG monitoring should be performed. On the less potent end, we have one of my favorite sedative agents, which is dexmedetomidine, and it has slightly similar kinetics to alfentanyl, um, at least in terms of context-sensitive half-time. In the short term, there is a distribution phase such that infusions are often started high and then dialed back. It used to be routinely started with a loading dose, but this carries a higher risk of major cardiovascular effects like severe bradycardia. In the longer term, it becomes relatively context independent, making it a useful adjunct in ICU sedation. That's it. If you want more information, check out some of my sources. Deranged physiology is just a standing recommendation at this point. I'm also going to mention um, the anesthetic YouTube channel Ketamine Nightmares, who has a whole series on pharmacokinetics that covers a lot of this content. 
there's a podcast called ICU Primary Prepcast, which is specifically for the Australian CICM primary exam. This is excellent and quite comprehensive. It's where I got the awesome point about maximum clearance rates of different organs. I'll put the links to these in the description. Otherwise, this was an anesthetic heavy video, so I used a lot of the same references as the neuromuscular junction video. Peck and Harris is probably the highest yield. If you want a book that properly dives into the mathematical stuff, check out the last book, Basic Pharmacokinetics. I previously got an ebook of the second edition a while ago, but there's a new one out and it's quite comprehensive. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe and share with others. If you found it useful or have other feedback, let me know in the comments. The next video will be a short one about pharmaceutics. Goodbye.